Fire Emblem Awakening is often regarded as the game that quote-unquote saved the series, often credited with this title for its significantly stronger marketing and widespread appeal. This ambitious title set the groundwork for a new era of Fire Emblem games. Winding back the clock all the way back to post-FE12, this video sets out to answer the question in as much detail as possible. How did Awakening save the series? What was going on in the developers' minds to concoct a game so mechanically and aesthetically different than its predecessors? Before we answer these questions though, allow me to introduce you to the key players involved. The staff. Kohei Maeda and Genki Yokota. These two names may be familiar to Fire Emblem fans, and if you've watched my previous three Fire Emblem development videos, you'd no doubt recognize these two. What's interesting here is Maeda's history with Fire Emblem. In Path of Radiance, Radiant Dawn, and Shadow Dragon, he was credited for scenario support slash assistance. In New Mystery, he was credited for director and adaptation. Yokota, on the other hand, was simply credited under special thanks in New Mystery. Maeda remained a director for Awakening, but Yokota took that role this time too. The producers were Hitoshi Yamagami, who has been the producer for nearly every Fire Emblem game in the franchise, and Toru Narihiro, who returned from the last DS entry. Yusuke Kozaki was contacted and later hired as the character designer and illustrator, as Intelligent Systems wanted someone who could deliver appealing designs for potential newcomers of the series. His work was supervised by Toshiyuki Kosakahara, the art director, and Takayasu Morisawara, the design supervisor. Nami Komuro worked as the character planner, while the scenario became a collaborative effort between her, Maeda, and others. The story, for the most part, ended up being Maeda's work. Hiroki Morishita and Rei Kondo were tasked with music directing and composition respectively. Lastly, Studio Madhouse animated the game's cutscenes. As for the whole localization process, unlike past Fire Emblem games, the Japanese firm 8-4 was chosen to take care of the process, instead of being done in-house by Nintendo Treehouse like before. The Swan Song To provide a clear picture of how Awakening came to be, it's important to do a very quick recap of the situation the franchise was in financially. Not good. The last game that could be said to have sold well in recent years was Sacred Stones for the Game Boy Advance, with around 800,000 copies sold worldwide. The Tellius duology didn't even manage to break 1 million units together, and despite the second half being on the Wii, it actually ended up selling around 100,000 less than the GameCube prequel. Shadow Dragon sold around 500,000 internationally, and the last game, New Mystery of the Emblem, didn't even break past 250,000 units and was also a Japanese exclusive. As a result, the Fire Emblem team at Intelligence Systems faced the very real possibility that, should their next entry underperform, the Fire Emblem series could very well end right there. Thus, the team began looking for ways to make the Fire Emblem formula as attractive to newcomers as possible, with the clear aim of redefining what Fire Emblem-ness was. So what made things different this time around? Simple redefining its emblem-likeness. Yes, throughout development of FE games, I was always using the term emblem-like. For example, such and such is very emblem-like, so let's put it in. Or, that's not really emblem-like, take it out. When planning with the staff, a lot of un-emblem-like things were discussed. If I had stopped them there, then the game would be no different than the rest of the series up until now, however. Basically, I figured to truly get a new Fire Emblem game, I should let the conversation continue. So from a more objective point of view, we ended up adding a lot of material that wouldn't really be considered emblem-like at all. This process was very important for its development. IS was split on two teams, the Conservatives, people in favor of keeping the series' identity intact, which had Masahiro Higuchi, and the reformists, those proposing newer and revolutionary additions, such as Toshiki Kisakahara, while a mediator, who would be Kohai Maeda, would try striking the perfect balance between both ideas. Brainstorming in the process of designing a name for this game, the standard Fire Emblem logo received a makeover with the purpose of expressing the kind of change intelligence systems had been wanting to communicate while making an impact with its fanbase. As for the name, during concept stages, the game initially had the subtitle of Fan. 
Other subtitles considered were Fire Emblem 2011 and Children of the Brink, or Children from the End of Time, depending on the translation. In the end, they went with Awakening, because as silly as it may sound, Intelligent Systems was looking for a name that was impactful, and it just happened to do the trick. Plot setting. Where to start? Multiple ideas were proposed as the game began to take shape, so to start, it would be a good idea to give them an honorable mention. It's worth noting that while many existed a few years before Awakening's inception, these were also considered but ultimately shelved for it due to being too drastic. One idea was to have the game take place in the modern world instead of the recurring western medieval fantasy-esque setting. Another was going to the other extreme and tried capturing a fairy tale like feel. Lastly, there was the proposal of having the game and its fights take place on Mars. Like the actual planet Mars. Either way, for Awakening, the team chose to focus instead on making the ultimate Fire Emblem game, which would be a culmination of everything that had come previously. On a trivial note, Chrom's character and design was very much inspired by the series' most popular protagonists, such as Ike and Marth, being meant to be, in essence, someone who could represent the spirit of the protagonists that appeared before him. Broader Appeal Given it was of utmost importance to capture newcomers' attention, it should come as no surprise many additions took this in mind. Case in point, Avatar and Casual Mode While the idea of an avatar, a character representing the player's point of view, by this point wasn't exactly new, as the first FE entry the West ever got happened to feature one with Mark the Tactician, the presence of a heavily customizable avatar and Casual Mode, aka disabling permadeath, were added in Awakening, as a side effect of being carryovers from New Mystery, which had previously implemented these for the sake of making the series more accessible. Despite casual mode in Japan not really being new as a feature though, there was at first some hesitance over its addition because it would harm people's enjoyments of the series, which thankfully didn't end up being the case by the time they began trying it out. Some people think casual mode is heresy, while no doubt some would say they only discovered the enjoyment of Fire Emblem because of it. Yes, there are quite a few of the latter, especially among team members who played it for the first time. Some said it was difficult without casual play, so I thought Yamagami-san had shown foresight. Sorry for getting huffy about that on the phone. What ended up being the S-rank confessions for the Avatar, which became the trend here, was initially proposed by Maeda himself, which didn't quite thrill neither the conservative camp of the team nor the character designer Kozaki himself. The original concept had considered the new characters doing quote-unquote kissy faces in special CGs. And while the first part didn't make it, special effects such as sparkles and lights were added afterwards to give these scenes more flair. Well, I already mentioned regarding how plain un-emblem-like it was, but on top of that, the original proposal that was written to me involved kissy faces. That is just one example of why it greatly disturbed me. Kissy faces. Yes. There are plenty of games that feature girls making such faces, but not really any with men, so we figured that it may have some merit to it in that proposal. I remember my conclusion was, please don't go that far. Even the character designer Yusuke Kozaki was opposed to it. But it's cool that every character got a confession picture, huh? Not just pretty characters either. Gangrel and Walhart have one too. We figured that it was definitely something new, we also figured it would probably make male players very uncomfortable. When people meme on Awakening, saying it became way too anime, it's funny to look back and find more validity in those statements. Deliberate trying to capture the appeal of shoujo manga, a target demographic for female teens, clearly succeeded here. That being said, there was a conscious effort not to alienate or make male players too uncomfortable, and they limited the confession scenes to just illustrations. But I suppose they became more confident in that shoujo vibe, seeing as how Fates had not just implemented the kissy faces, but CG kissy faces. Street Pass The game making use of 3DS's Street Pass feature came to mostly during a brainstorming process where the team was trying to find a use for the feature, and figured that, should two players within the game happen to get close to one another, that could be used somehow which later became the whole send your team to others, purchase items from them, fight them as enemies, and even recruit one unit feature. Street Pass became an incredibly popular feature for the game, even surprising the developers themselves. Pair-ups. 
By far, the most impactful gameplay addition for Awakening was its pair-up mechanic, which allows players to do exactly just that between two characters of their choice for battle. The idea was to have the cast express their bonds in battle in a far more explicit way, allowing them to grow stronger like this and helping each other out, while also giving players more ways to experience the gameplay regardless of the difficulty slash balancing concerns it raised. The Marriage and Children Mechanic the marriage and children mechanic, initially introduced in Genealogy of the Holy War, was included and improved in Awakening because the game had love as a big theme for all of its characters. Things didn't start so smoothly though, as there were discussions on raising the number of pairings and having the feature compatible with the avatar. On another note, while a time skip would still need to happen to make the Shepherd's children available, unlike Genealogy, none of their parents' lives ended up being compromised. Downloadable Content Awakening became one of Nintendo's first entries to feature downloadable content, which is something Intelligent Systems came up with two months before the game went gold, as a matter of fact. So it didn't really impact the content from the base game already. Speaking of DLC, up until the release of Awakening, paid DLC was not really a common thing to see in Nintendo games. Was this also a trial run for something new? What was the aim behind it? Well, we wanted to continue bringing attention to Awakening in a big way. After all, a game that is a finished, packaged product can no longer be expanded upon. It all just ends when it's sold. In other words, you wanted to lengthen its relevance in players' minds and get more people to play it? Yes, thanks to that, Awakening was picked up by many players. Up until then, the FE series had never really been seen as a moneymaker for those at Nintendo. So for example, before we couldn't really use these characters beyond what was in the original version, but with DLC, we expanded the lifespan of the game well beyond the initial release version, and were able to tide players over until the next DLC release, and so on. The first released DLC pack put a heavy focus on fans of older Fire Emblem entries and thus brought back characters from past games via the form of magic cards called Einherjars. Interestingly, this was a late development, as the initial plan was to just have the characters appear as themselves first, before Maeda went, and I quote, I want to add 120 characters, and noticed they would need to explain why their appearances would be all over the place. As for the recruitable Einherjars, featuring new designs, IS brought back previous artists that worked on Sacred Stones, the Tellius Duology, Binding Blade, New Mystery of the Emblem, Berwick's Satellaview Fire Emblem, and the illustrator from Binding Blade's manga adaptation, as well as new ones which IS either contacted themselves, were brought in by Kozaki, or were contacted by the artists themselves, like in Hakan's case. Usually their designs and default classes would be chosen by default by intelligent systems and the artists would end up having to elaborate their designs further. Awakening introduced two classes, which were conceived as DLC content. Brides, which was a brand new infantry class, and Dreadfighters, whose last and only appearance by then was in the form of Fire Emblem Gaiden. The second pass happened thanks to the good fan reception of the first one we got, and since Intelligent Systems didn't have anything planned for a potential second wave, they started brainstorming ideas while also introducing the new pack with this cover. This picture shows all the things we wanted to put in if we were given a chance to work on Awakening again. It is the embodiment of what could have been depicted by a single image. This pack aimed to cater to fans of Fire Emblem Awakening exclusively, unlike the previous one. It was more challenging, featured a new story, the future past mini-saga, and new conversations between units. Plus, it had fan service involving Awakening characters that scored a ton of votes in the game's Japanese polls. Localization Changes it should come as no surprise that Fire Emblem Awakening received some localization changes, so I'll make a note of the most noteworthy stuff here. For starters, Robin in Japan not only had the option of using four different voice packs, in which one of them makes them mute, rather than three, but the script would also change notably depending on the voice chosen, which was streamlined to just one script elsewhere. Another particular change made outside of Japan was that, should Lucina and Owain marry, their status will display as companions, rather than husband and wife. As for character-related changes, there's a few cases worth mentioning. Gregor spoke with a very tough and masculine speech pattern in the Japanese version, which was changed overseas into a Russian accent. How Henry's handled differs a lot between both versions. In Japanese, he's cheerful and childish, yet has a perverse yet innocent side that can catch people off guard. That, and he doesn't really joke that much, and does take things seriously when it matters. International Henry, meanwhile, is more of a friendly neighborhood maniac kind of guy. 
He's funny, loves puns, is openly into very creepy stuff, and doesn't appear to understand what's right from wrong. Severus' character in the original was a textbook example of a tsundere, a Japanese term for a character development process that depicts a character with a personality who is initially cold, short-tempered, and sometimes even hostile, etc., before gradually showing a warmer, friendlier side over time. Outside of Japan, she uses a lot more insults when speaking to others, which can cause a totally different impression. While Inigo's personality is the same between both versions, his Japanese voice acting makes him come off more like a Casanova doofus, while his English one went for a more handsome suave route. In Krom and Sumia's support chain, Sumia gifts Krom a bento box with vegetables rather than pie. Then you have the changes which exist between North American and PAL versions of the game most of which correct slight mistakes, rename some concepts such as paralogues and xenologues into side stories and outrealm tales respectively, and rewrite dialogue for the sake of making conversations less risque, such as Tharja and Noe's conversation in the DLC mission, Harvest Scramble. And on that note, one of the most well-known and notorious changes that happened with localization involved the DLC map, Summer Scramble, specifically with one CG displaying Tharja in a bikini due to scoring high in Japanese popularity polls. For those on aware, in the original, the CG shows Tharja in full body. The international version, meanwhile, censors a portion of her with a curtain. And believe it or not, this particular change ended up being noticed by intelligence systems themselves, and they said the following about the whole thing. After the DLC released, we were called out for the scene involving Tharja in a swimsuit. This is way too lewd, we heard. The people around me said, you seem to be paralyzed from having okayed this but it actually had to do with the rating systems. So in North America, they chose to hide part of Tharja's swimsuit, but in their efforts to conceal it, we heard it ended up being taken as even more suggestive. To me, these are the most interesting highlights we could find with regards to the developer interviews about Awakening. This game had many paths to succeed in their goal to create an amazing, and potentially final, Fire Emblem experience, reflecting upon their successful formula. I think we can now provide at least a more detailed take on the famous question. How did Fire Emblem Awakening save the series? The ultimate culmination. A lot of people recognize Fire Emblem Awakening as the game that saved the franchise by now, so it goes without saying how much of a success story it ended up being for intelligent systems. And from an outside perspective, it seems obvious why it ended up doing so well. Yet, what about IS themselves? What do they think? To tell you the truth, it was a very big surprise. I honestly still don't understand why it was such a success, as we didn't realize we didn't make any change to our philosophy to make Awakening be liked outside Japan. I still don't understand why it's so popular. It's strange. When making games, it's really difficult to be loved by everyone, but it's easier to start thinking, what should I do not to be disliked by everyone? This way of thinking is easier. If one pays attention to the evidence though, there are a few things which do provide us a clue in what changed for Fire Emblem fans beyond Japan. Fire Emblem Awakening was first announced in Japan as Fire Emblem 3DS in September of 2011. And while people there were happy, months passed. The game released in Japan in April 2012, and there was no word about a potential international release, which worried some as New Mystery's Japan exclusive status raised the possibility it could end up having the same fate. Enter June of 2012. After a 3DS showcase, people from Kotaku approached Reggie Fielzame, then president of Nintendo's North American branch, and asked him about Fire Emblem Awakening, mistakenly confirming the game would come overseas without making any official statement. Sometime later, Nintendo's social media accounts delivered the official news. We are excited to confirm a new game announcement coming to the US. The new 3DS Fire Emblem. More info to come. Then, in January of next year, one month before the game's release in North America, a demo of Awakening containing the prologue and its first chapter was released in the 3DS eShop, giving newer players the means to give the franchise a shot. A heavy marketing push also began taking place, raising even more awareness of this entry, and finally, the game was released on February 4th in North America, and later in April for both EU and Australia. So if you ask me, I would say Awakening's secret for international success was a combination of various factors. 
For one, its development added many new features the West took a liking to. And while they didn't do things that appealed directly to the Western market, they also didn't try to alienate it from them either. Also, the game was released when the 3DS was at its prime, and was getting successful RPGs non-stop, such as Pokemon X and Y, Atrian Odyssey, and Bravely Default. Lastly, its heavy marketing push and demo likely contributed to making some buzz around that worked in Awakening's favor. IS was able to toe the line successfully between honoring what made Fire Emblem what it was from a gameplay perspective, innovating on the formula of its predecessors. It went deep into its roots by pulling inspiration from genealogy of the Holy War's famous marriage system, but also provided a fresh take on this by greatly expanding upon the pairing options and, in a bid to appeal to a broader demographic, they deliberately appealed to the shoujo manga crowd by putting a heavy emphasis on supports and confession scenes through the lens of the now stable Avatar character. Casual mode, while first given friction by some of the developers, ended up being a great idea to appeal to the first time Fire Emblem crowd even more. Kozaki drew inspiration in his character designs as a newcomer to the series himself, creating more unique and fresh takes on character and class designs, with the hopes that it would pull in new fans too. Street Pass contributed greatly to the game's hype and provided cooperative appeal that simply never existed before, and the DLC kept the game immensely relevant long after its release. All of this, combined with its never-before-tried marketing push and prime-time golden era for the 3DS and RPGs, blew the door completely open for the game's success, so much so that the developers themselves were stunned by the numbers. I suppose that's because what we made was the ultimate culmination. What exactly does the ultimate culmination mean? As you pointed out, various opinions arose in pulling together a culmination, but we were like, to achieve our goal, let's just put in everything. And the power of the development team achieved all kinds of things. We hardly wavered, so we were able to surpass a culmination to pull off the ultimate culmination. Reading the developer interview with Iwata asks, you could tell very quickly that this game absolutely oozed passion. Whenever one man came up with an idea, the rest of the team said, put it in. And over and over, as new ideas came through, they just kept adding on. And even though the challenge was great, they enjoyed it and thrived off one another's passion. Offscript Fargast here, and I just want to say thank you everyone so much for watching. It's been almost two weeks since my last upload, but like I mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the video, I've been dealing with an annoying head cold and congestion, so hopefully uh, you guys like this new video. It took a while to come out. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed from the last video. This channel is now less than 500 subscribers away from 90,000, which is crazy we're almost at 90k so if you haven't subscribed yet but these videos are showing up in your recommended feed please consider subscribing it's free and takes no time at all i also want to give a big thank you to my patreons as well whose names are on the screen now without their constant support there's no way this channel could be doing as well as it has been it's funny to think about awakening now in that since it came out almost 10 years ago that a lot of Awakening babies are now like series veterans technically. So comment down below your story with Awakening or you know just on this video or the development process that you found interesting. All links to the interviews that were used in the script are going to be linked in the description as well. Let me know about your history with Awakening and your experience with your first Fire Emblem game or anything of that sort. And as always thank you so much for leaving a like comment and a subscription and with that all being said have a good rest of your week not sure what the next video is going to be to be super honest with you but i will keep you posted on my community tab thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time deuces